I am here to talk about Python. Uh, Python has some very good things going for it. Python, it's very quick to iterate and make scripts. Um, it's got lots of uh, library support, so you can do pretty much anything with it. Uh, the syntax is very easy to understand, even for newcomers. It's very flexible language, and in most cases, it's quick enough. That's not to say it's quick, but it's quick enough for uh, most use cases. If you're writing performance critical things, probably not Python, but in general, it's fine. And Python, as uh, many people are aware, is a dynamically typed language. That is, uh, types are not checked at compile time, and types are only checked at runtime. So you can conceivably run into a situation where you get an error halfway through your program because you're trying to add an integer to a string. Um, however, Python is also a dynamic language, and the definition of this is a bit harder to nail down. But uh, effectively, dynamic languages uh, can support creating new types and new code at runtime things like the exec and eval functions, and um, defining classes at runtime. This dynamic nature of Python allows us some very useful built-in things. So for example, pdb and sys.setTrace are the built-in Python debugging functions that are written themselves in Python, which allow for powerful uh, viewing of what's going on inside your program while it's running. There's the inspect library, which allows you to view stack frames, the source code of a given function, and so on. You can have classes that are defined or not, depending on what the version or platform you're running the code on, uh, which allows you to do platform-specific optimizations. And you have runtime reflection, uh, which lets you see the fields of a class uh, at runtime, and monkey patching, which lets you overwrite methods uh, with customers. And so the standard library uses this dynamic stuff in very interesting ways. So uh, you have a built-in thing that lets you uh, do dynamic dispatch on a function just by uh, adding a decorator, and it looks at the uh, type of the first argument and picks the best implementation. And then in terms of external libraries, there's LaTeXify, which given a function uh, will return the LaTeX form of that function, which is very useful. Uh, however, I'm not here to talk about good Python. I am here to talk about cursed Python. Um, so if we take a look at the title slide, um, this is a program that took two days to write because it is a beautiful piece of artwork, and yet when you run it, it prints the zen of Python. Beautiful is better than ugly, and my favorite one of these is readability counts. Sure, Python. Sure. Um, so the zen of Python, uh, it's, they aren't rules, but they are ideas on how to write nice, clean, Pythonic code. These are the ones we are going to explicitly violate. You can make arguments for the others, but these ones are fairly cut and dry. So let's get right into the first of our uh, interesting cases, variable binding. Most people think of variable binding as just the arguments to a function and assignments, and that's broadly speaking true. Um, however, there's a bit of nuance, and where there is nuance in Python, there is jank. Uh, so let's have a look at some of that. So multiple assignment is a very useful feature of Python that lets you assign to multiple things at the same time. Um, and so, for example, here, the v1 and v2 point to the same list. This is useful for defining constants, and for getting multiple views on the same object, uh, which does have its uses. However, it also lets you write code like this. And the question is, after the first line, what does A contain? A contains the list containing itself, which uh, is a bit of a surprise when you run into it the first time. Um, and similarly, uh, after the second line, uh, A contains the list containing itself and the empty list, um, which this feed, it's, a, it's a feature of Python, and it has its good uses, but it also has its shenanigans. Uh, the match statement was introduced in Python 3.10. Uh, even if you've not uh, come across it before, uh, the syntax is fairly clear. Uh, you have something, and you are checking, is it similar enough to the first case? If not, the second case, and so on. So here, when you run this, it will take the other branch, because um, even though it is uh, structurally the same as the first branch, it fails a condition. So if we run this, which is similar, uh, note that the underscore here uh, means match any pattern, don't bind any names, uh, I just want it to match everything. Uh, and if we run this, we of course get a syntax, uh, a name error. I'm just kidding. No, uh, a print six. Um, because the uh, binding of the names happens uh, on the structure matching, and only then, after the names have been bound, does it check if the conditions are fulfilled. And so um, what that means is that this match statement is semantically equivalent to a normal assignment, um, which uh, is not at all confusing. Variable binding has its other side, variable unbinding, uh, which in most cases is just the delete statement. So let's have a look at these. Where here is the variable a valid? It's fairly intuitive that it uh, goes like this. On the left, a is valid from where it's defined to where it's deleted, and on the right, a is valid within its own function. Uh, and for future reasons, uh, I'm also going to annotate the other variables uh, that already exist in scope. 
Um, so then the question becomes, for a try except, what is the lifetime or the scope of the variable e? Your first answer would be, oh, well, it's, it's just that. It's valid from the beginning of the exception block to the end, and it's invalid after that. And the answer is broadly correct. We'll come back to that. You see, uh, CPython uses a reference-counted memory model. Um, and so to prevent reference cycles, um, which would cause your program to be unable to free any memory uh, from this point forwards, um, CPython turns the try except block on the left into the, pretty much the one on the right. There's a little bit of nuance, but it's effectively uh, equivalent. And what that means is that this is in fact incorrect. The correct layout would be this. Uh, if you have a variable called e in the outer scope, it gets deleted if an exception is raised. Um, which means that a function like this, when it gets called, has a chance to delete the global variable e. You won't necessarily know about it because, uh, for example, the out of memory error can be raised at any point in the program um, and uh, then your variable is gone. Um, so be careful with naming your variables. Moving on, we have annotations, which most people will know as type hints because that is the uh, generally accepted use of annotations. And annotations are interesting. They are gradual, so you can add them as and when you want, and they aren't necessary. Annotations are stored in two places, either on the object itself or in a magically created uh, double underscore annotations object that Python inserts whenever you uh, add a necessary annotation. These are what the variables contain. Uh, note that int does not have a attribute called annotations. Um, and this is fine. This uh, allows for type checking, which is always a good thing. And it's also worth noting that Python doesn't actually treat these as they are. Python converts them into other forms under the hood. So it looks like that. And it's, uh, I should say that the function uh, annotations are uh, added to the function at the time that the function is compiled. So you can't separate the function annotations, but you can separate the um, variable annotations, even though it never typically is. However, if we think back as to what the annotations were, it wasn't, it wasn't this, and it wasn't this. It was this, which makes you think, because that is the representation of a dict containing the class int. Not the uh, text that we put in, but the actual class int. Um, though I should say that this uh, is planned to be changed in the future. Um, so what this means is because there is no type level logic in Python, everything is an object, um, that it must be evaluating things. So if you have a type hint of five, that's fine. Python can deal with that. And lists, that's all fine. But it's just, it's just an expression. So you can evaluate the expression and you get your uh, corresponding type hint. But where it becomes truly cursed is that uh, in Python, functions are also expressions, which lets you have these annotations and also printed the output. Oh no, indeed. And so if, in theory, we write a program that opens the file that we are uh, currently running, reads the file, closes the file, because that's just good practice, and then prints the contents, um, and we put it through the magical one linifying machine, um, we have this program, which if you ignore type hints, like uh, many editors do, um, you have this. It's not quite a no-op, but it's, it, it does nothing effectively. However, when you run it, it prints itself. Um, so yes, and on the subject of turning things into one line, we are going to turn things into one line, because mostly because we can. And I'm sure everyone's felt, oh, there are too many lines in this program, let's make it fewer. So the question now becomes, what can we turn into one line? Well, we start with these three main things of Python syntax. We have statements of the types simple and compound, and expressions. Expressions are already one line, so we're sorted there. And so what we want to do is we want to turn all the statements into expressions. And can we do that? The answer is yes-ish. There are some cases in which we can't, but broadly, yes, we can turn everything into an expression. So what we want to do is we want to take Python source code. We want to read it into an abstract syntax tree, which the standard library does for us. We want to turn it uh, into uh, a syntax tree representing an expression. And then we want to use the standard library to turn it back into source code. And I mean, we just need to transform the syntax nodes, right? How hard can it be? Well, to begin with, all the nodes that are already representing expressions, they're already done for us. So that is uh, 53 out of the 111 AST nodes um, are done for us. Uh, that's 48%, and I will take that. So now just, just, just the other ones, right? Um, so the trivial ones are ones that are either already ignored by Python or have a corresponding expression format. Uh, I should note that the x um, note here is the statement containing an expression as opposed to an expression, but it's still easy to pull out the expression. Here's where we get into the things where you actually have to think of it. The ones that require care. 
they aren't difficult, and you can solve them with some very simple Python tools. However, in the spec and the docs and so on, uh, there are edge cases in their design which you just have to account for. So it's, uh, you have to be systematic in how you approach it, but it's not that difficult to take on. Then there come the cursed ones. Here are four, and uh, your rays can't really be done, um, however it can be mostly done. Delete, uh, you can only do uh, with implementation-specific tricks. Try can be implemented with with, and with can be implemented with try. However, the docs do not say that there is a way to do it. Uh, there is, however, a way to do it. And then, unfortunately, there are some nodes that we can't transform into one line, which are the async ones, the scope modifying ones, and the generators. It, it might be theoretically possible to do so, but you'd have to re-implement pretty much the entirety of the Python interpreter in Python, which kind of defeats the point. And then the final class of them are the match uh, nodes for the match statement, as seen earlier. For this one, it's fairly simple. We have the spec for Python structural pattern matching, um, and you can just re-implement uh, re it in Python. Um, which is about 200 lines long and allows you to turn normal, readable, human match, uh, uh, match statements from this into this abomination, um, which does exactly the same thing as the default match, even including the variable binding shenanigans. And it also lets you take perfectly normal and innocent Pygame programs and turn them into this, which uh, was 283 lines long originally and uh, has increased its uh, character count by 50%. It also runs 16 times slower. So yes, you can one lineify pretty much everything in Python. I should also, to go back to an old slide, point out that the title of the slide uh, is a program and is in fact an expression. So if we hop over to here uh, and we copy that expression and we just hop into Python, all expressions in Python evaluate to something. So then the question is, what does this program evaluate to? And it could be none, it could be a string, or it could be something else, uh, something entirely unexpected. Now we come to our final and possibly most cursed item uh, to demonstrate, importing. The import machinery in Python is very complicated. Normally you just write uh, import module and you're done. But uh, the stuff that goes on behind the scenes is quite interesting. I should note that when you uh, do an import from a module, um, that is equivalent to importing the module, uh, extracting the item, and uh, deleting the module. As long as we can attack the import, we can also attack the from import. So what actually happens when you import a module in Python? Python finds the module you're talking about. Uh, some, most modules are found on disk. Um, some modules are built into the Python interpreter. Uh, some modules can be loaded from zip files or network resources, um, but it needs to be found first. Uh, then Python creates an empty module type, uh, effectively a namespace. Um, with the built-in spec information about where the module came from. Uh, then Python runs the code from the module and captures all the variables and functions and classes you define, and then it stores that defined stuff in the namespace. Except it actually does those last two steps the other way around. Um, presumably to detect cyclical imports and other things like that. The uh, equivalent code for the running is that. And finally, it uh, binds the originally requested name to the module. Uh, however, this leads to shenanigans. Here we're going to import uh, a file module.py. If that module.py well, contains an error, then you'll get an error, and it looks all very sensible. Uh, this is entirely expected. However, if we have this mystery module, um, then when we run it, we get an error in the standard import library, which sh you, sh you shouldn't do. So what, what, what's causing this? What are these mystery contents? These mystery contents delete the module from the system modules. And so back here, where we add the module to the imported lookup, that is sys.modules. And because you are executing the module that you are importing, you can modify sys.modules during the import process. We can change what object the module will be. Now, I looked long and hard to find uh, an existing library that used this technique, and I did eventually find one, which is a Python error handling library. You can import the library and use the library as a function. You can use the library as a decorator, and you can use the library as a context manager, and it simply removes errors. And this is amazing, um, because it uses a, a little talked about feature of Python, the uh, ability to modify the import system, and uh, uses it in a useful fashion. There is one more import related thing, uh, which is mathematics. So here we have the file called one. So let's import one, oh, if I can spell. 
so one, it's, it's just a module. Uh, there is nothing funny going on here. However, well, what is one plus one? Well, one plus one is two. And we now have a file called two, which we can import. So let's do some more maths. Two to the power of two plus one is the module five. And there's now a module called five. Um, and you can keep going and on and on and on. And uh, negative numbers and everything is supported. And this is uh, defining uh, additional functions on the uh, module itself, um, which I'm sure has a, a use. But you know, uh, we're not here to provide productive uses of the Python techniques. And there is just one final thing, one final truly, truly cursed aspect of Python. You see, in the background, we have had uh, the Zen of Python represented by our little logo here. Uh, if we run it again, and we just add the output to the file n.py. Um, this is not a valid Python file. It is syntactically invalid. Uh, it's just a piece of art with some comments at the top. So, of course, it can't do anything. Um, thank you for listening.